remote. So. Hi, my name is Fabio. I work for the Interleges program at the Brazilian Federal Senate. I'll be presenting here a talk about Interleges infrastructure. Uh, so, I work at the Interleges program for the Brazilian Federal Senate. This is my, these are my, this is my contact. If you want to contact me later. Uh, I worked there since 2009 with infrastructure automation and uh, with a lot of different technologies, as you can see. And my motto is to keep calm and automate when things get rough. Uh, we automate things and, and uh, make it work. Hi, my name is Fabio. I work for the Interleges program at the Brazilian Federal Senate. I'll be presenting here a uh, talk about Interleges infrastructure. Uh, so I work at the Interleges program for the Brazilian Federal Senate. This is my these are my, this is my contacts. If you want to contact me later, uh, I worked there since 2009 with infrastructure automation and uh, with a lot of different technologies, as you can see. And my motto is to keep calm and automate when things get rough. Uh, we automate things and and uh, make it work. So the Interleges program is a program to modernize and integrate the Brazilian legislative branch. Uh, we host uh, products at the Brazilian Federal Senate's data center for, to achieve these goals. Uh, we host around 1,300 hosting instances right now and uh, a lot of other products as well. Uh, Brazilian municipalities, they need only internet connection to, to uh, work and they are good to go. So this is a map with uh, every uh, Brazilian municipality that uses one of our products at, at least. And we have one international cooperation hosting at the National People Assembly of Guinea-Bissau at parlamento.gw. So I work with hosting automation and uh, we have a small team. So this requires more efficient processes. Automation is key to maintain the quality and provide quicker service provisioning. The services, they should be uh, self-healing and self-service uh, whenever they can. And the services infrastructure should be standardized. We, we can't uh, allow uh, many pets. We, we need cattle to, to, to make this thing work. So I'll be talking about hosting evolution. We started with shell scripts. We then went on to Puppet uh, with uh, shared application instances. Uh, later on, we started with Docker and Ranger 1.0 with dedicated instances uh, using Docker containers in NFS storage for Docker volumes. We then started with Docker in Rancher 2, which is Kubernetes based. Uh, we use dedicated instances managed by Kubernetes then with uh, NFS storage at, at first using NFS provisioner. We, we used automated VM creation in uh, Zen server and Nginx ingress with disk based cache. We use Docker uh, in Rancher 2.5 then uh, with uh, cloud native storage provided by VMware vSphere. And we, we allowed Nginx to serve pages from the cache when the backend is down. So we don't need uh, many resources to host a single web portal. We use Kubernetes because uh, it's an open source system for automating the deployment, scaling and management of applications in containers. It manages multiple container hosts. It is more complex, but more powerful as well. And, and uh, mainly it, it provides us with abstraction and portability. So we can run our workloads on premises or on the cloud. At Interleges, we use Rancher 2.5 right now for cluster management. We use uh, VMware Cloud Native Storage uh, with block-based storage in SSDs, uh, SSD disks. We used uh, an ingress controller, which is our reverse proxy by uh, Bitsunami in using the Nginx uh, web server with SSD disk-based cache. And for a virtual IP address for this cluster, we use Metal LB, Start Manager to issue uh, Let's Encrypt certificates automatically. And we use the Valero uh, for backup. Valero is a open source uh, project by VMware to provide backup. So uh, to 
To manage the configuration of, of all the services, we use Helm, which is the package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, they they self-described uh, as this. And we allow templating of Kubernetes YAML files uh, using Go templating language. It manages the application lifecycle uh, from uh, installation to upgrades. And so we develop a lot of interledges charts. Uh, you can check out at our Git uh, web server. So with Helm charts, we, we can have uh, uh, a nice uh, visualization of all of our products. And we can use uh, a nice uh, web form to, to install the services and to manage the, the properties of these services. So uh, even our, our interns can manage the, these services. So thank you. I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll be um, I'll be available for, for questions uh, at our at my Twitter or uh, other other means. I drunk off. We need to talk about Quave world domination. And the plan for this world domination, well, first off, I need to congratulate uh, Joel and the EMUO team and also Finitic for organizing this conference in Amur. It's been three years since we met physically and it's great that this is now happening. And I'm very uh, sad that I'm not with you right now, but I will get to that later. So congratulations to EMU also for bringing Quave to their client base. Um, and the plan for this was hatched uh, at the last uh, physical uh, conference in Italy, in Ferrara, where over many uh, nice cappuccinos, uh, we hatched the plan uh, for world domination of Quave starting in Belgium. And the way we do that is by uh, bundling Quave, which is, you know, you know, Quave is a very complex stack. It was uh, quite a lot of work to bundle that into Docker containers, but we have that up and running now. So we now have Quave in a box in a way that the Imeo uh, operations team can easily deploy out to their clients. Uh, and that's all fully automated. So it doesn't need involvement of the Quave team to actually ship a new instance. And one of the big milestones of that is that uh, the city of the Mur, where you are right now, they will deploy a new uh, Quave intranet uh, in next week for, well, for the municipality of Namur, which is a big uh, installation. So that's all uh, great news. Uh, like I said, I wish I were there, but also I wish I'll, I'm happy I'm not, because the reason I'm not is that I got married a few weeks ago to this beautiful lady here. And so now I'm in the Himalayas, uh, trekking with this beautiful lady and enjoying Nepal while you're uh, doing the conference. So while I wish I was there with you, I'm also really happy I'm not. And I do hope to see you all again next year at the 2023 Blog Conference. And then, until then, bye Blog Conf. Almost. Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, hi. I'm introducing Plum Remix. Um, I'm Nicola. I'm a front-end developer. Uh, I'm working on sustainable IT, 
working on research and development to minimize the impact of web, web technologies. So, um, and diving into performances. Uh, what is Remix? Remix is a full stack JavaScript web framework. Um, essentially, it is based on React Rotor within the server. Um, everything is a form and <clears throat> Their slogan is use the platform. Uh, when I say everything has a form, because every mutation, every uh, update, uh, or post, or every call is a form of form. So you actually use the web platform from the standards. And has quite few things which are interesting for performance. And I'm looking forward to work on that with Plone. Uh, so why creating Plone Remix for performances? Because with uh, their SSR first approach, we also have the partial iteration on the client. So not every uh, JavaScript bunch of code uh, goes to the client when it is not needed for rendering. Uh, I needed something really lightweight on the client. And I usually like to start project from scratch from a blank uh, page, creating a team for, from that. Uh, so if we, if we look at the Volto demo, which can be largely optimized, uh, we have some problems of resources, and few performance issues out of the box. Uh, Volt is great. Uh, I'm using it in production, and, but we have a lot of stuff there. As the, from Victor's talk, we know that there are plans going on. So this might be a, a first proof of concept of what we can achieve on Remix, and maybe as an experimental activity uh, to know if, if, it, if it is the good choice for that. Uh, it, is, it works like a, a plural front end. Uh, it is fully written in TypeScript. Uh, Again, uh, I don't want to choose any CSS framework, so you got only markup, few markup, and a blank page. Um, I recreated the, block, the render blocks functionality from Volto, so editing the content from Volto, then you can uh, render that from Remix. Uh, and I'm building it as a project template, so uh, if you go to the repository, you, you can click that. Uh, use this template, and you have a project to run. Uh, what I've done until now, um, we have a catch-all route uh, for the contents, so every content has its own route, uh, but it's the same uh, code that's run it. Um, it works with the multilingual routing, um, and it is customizable from the config uh, as, as we have in Volto. Um, and it's using Plone REST API client, which is another library I want to spotlight. Uh, it is a wrapper for having uh, the REST API calls from, from the Node environment, uh, everything typed. Um, maybe I don't have the time for the code, but everything is on this link, which is not accessible, maybe. Um, but you can find it as Plone Remix under the raw material uh, organization on GitHub. Uh, we also have an online demo now, which is a basic demo replicating the, the Vault demo we, also, we all know. Um, you can find the link in the repository. And the performances are quite better. Um, I will work on that, so if you're interested, we can talk and we'll keep up updated on that. Ciao.
Hello, uh, I am here on behalf of, of our friend Miko Otama. He asked me to show you this video, and I have to. Hello. Uh, he is organizing the first um, uh, conference for Python and blockchain. So if you are interested in either using blockchain with Python or you are already using it, you can participate. It's remote, it's free. And the call for papers are already on. And this is, I don't see if the website visible by, yeah. by chain.org. If anyone is interested, you're invited. That's it. Okay, hi. Um, so, um, for municipalities, EMU needed to uh, be able to compose pages uh, with blocks, uh, as we call sections. Um, and at that time, uh, the decision was made to use dexterity content types and stick to uh, Plone Classic UI instead of Folto for a series of uh, reasons. Um, the use of dexterity content types have have, uh, has be benefits, many benefits, and not so many drawbacks, as long as you have uh, good caching. Um, and thus we developed that, but it was not very generic. It was um, very related to uh, uh, immune customers' needs. So Sebastian um, took that concept and developed uh, a new package he stole your code. <laughs> he, stole, uh, he stole our code, <laughs> basically. Um, so there's a new kit on the block in the layout section of uh, Awesome Plone that's called Collective Content Sections. And he will show you that. Okay, hello. When you uh, install a Collective Content Section, the default uh, page content type uh, is replaced by, by a new one. Uh, which is called page two, and uh, yes, sorry, I'm. He hasn't slept much. Yes, a new page, and it's a folderish content type when you can add new uh, section. There is different type of section. I have just time to show the simple one, the text section. You had text one, it's uh, dexterity uh, content type. Oh. With three fields, two fields, title field, a rich field, and the lead image behavior activated. I will take a cut. Yes, right. Teaser. Hey, you have uh, the first section in your content type, and you can edit this one. Of course, you can add many more. I will just add another one. I typed up too much. Up, up. With another cut. <coughs> and you have layout uh, option like. Uh, uh, Volto block uh, variant. <laughs> uh, for example, can take this one, this one. Um, I can fill all the window with. I can register different classes in the taxonomy vocabulary. 
for example, background color black. Text color white. Okay. Of course, it's a uh, dexterity content type. Then you can copy paste other uh, content, other section, sorry, and paste them in another page. It's here with the background image. It's also a layout option. You can, of course, move the different section on the page. Here is the text section. You have another one. Yes, one minute. Image, save. It's a folderish content type that can, uh, uh, yes, up. contain images. Good. And of course, it's a uh, dexterity content type. You can register any view, any browser view on your content type. For example, you can use a card carousel view because Bootstrap is here. It's very easy. You can also um, edit some other layout. For example, here, group by two. And you have a carousel view with two images and I have no time to show the other section but you have a card section, link section, HTML section uh, and uh, also uh, collection sections. So please use it, try it, criticize it and tell us. <laughs> Thank you. It's terrible. Let me get a uh, smaller resolution. There we go. That's better? Better. Okay. Hi, uh, my name's Steve Piercy, and uh, I, <coughs> I basically help get documentation published. Um, I wanted to give special recognition to Katya Seuss because I'm going to show off her work today. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. Um, uh, to start off, I just wanted to show how easy it is to get started. Uh, I already um, cloned and then um, the repository and then did a command um, make, live uh, make live HTML, which <coughs> downloads the packages, installs, uh, clones the submodules, and downloads everything. Um, and to get it started, all you have to do is do that one command, and it will do that one, that one command will do all of those things for you. And then it brings up a live preview on your local computer. Now, that's pretty cool. Um, but there's more with this uh, documentation. Uh, one of the really cool things about it is that we, we took a really good time to organize this stuff to make it easier and more approachable. So we elevated certain subjects to the top level. And now it should be much easier to find things. But the thing that I'm really excited about is this search feature. 
Now you can actually see all the results in the context with things highlighted. And you can even filter by a specific product. So you can learn how to, you can focus on to just one section of uh, the documentation. Um, one thing I wanted to show too is that when you build documentation, you also get some nice warnings every once in a while to let you know, oh, we're missing something. So when I take a look at this warning, I go to this file, and it says on this line, there's a literal include. So I look at this little literal include and see, oh, there's a to-do there. Obviously, that can't be parsed by our extension for HTTP examples. <laughs> and when I go and look for it, oh, yeah, maybe we should fix that when we get the chance. Um, a couple other things, too, about this theme that are so awesome. Uh, there's this thing where you, if you get really deep into, oops, not this one. I want to get into the back end and then wrist and down into the API. And when you get way down here, you kind of lose your spot. Not anymore. It actually moves that navigation with you so it's consistent. Again, thank you, Katya. And a couple other things about this theme. As you scroll, you also see on the right-hand side that things are highlighted so you're able to find the contents and where you are. It's mobile-friendly, very responsive, um, and you get your nice little hamburger menus on either side. Uh, you can go full screen. Um, you can go to GitHub and file an issue if you find a bug. Uh, <clears throat> not that they ever exist in these things. <laughs> um, and last thing I wanted to go on is that this theme, even though it's Sp Sphinx book theme, it's actually got a parent theme called PyData. And I want to give you a little idea of what you can do. So this is coming. We're going to have a dark theme, finally, for, <laughs> for the documentation. There's an open uh, issue, and people are working on that pull request, and we hope to have it uh, available and released soon. Thank you. It's wrong resolution. Uh, let's see. Well, anyway, we're with you. That's enough. Okay. Um, we heard a lot about um, that clone could be a main mono repo, that we have clone base, that we may want in clone 7 organize things different in the back end and separate classic out of uh, the core and whatever. So many, many uh, thinkings about how to, what to do with Plow in the future. And at Beethoven Sprint, uh, we sat together and created what we call the Plow mental model. It's not an architecture because for an architecture is not enough. But the idea is that we think about where all the, our packages are actually um, located and if we want to put stuff somewhere, what, where to put it, right? And it looks like that we have the open, the CMF, and other packages at the base. And now, um, after some work, we did this plone.base package, which contains a lot of stuff that was pro previously in product CMF plone. And as you see now, we have now a better dependency chain because plone.base contains like all the interfaces that we define central, which are our contracts, a lot of tools, and uh, some other. Uh, some other functionality that is not dependent on anything than ZOP and CMF. And then there's this big chunk that we need to figure out what to do with, which is kind of the core. And then our mental model, that's, there's all this plone app something packages, the plone dexterity, plone app content types, plone app content uh, listing, and whatever we have there. 
we, that's, that's really something we need to discuss for the next level then for Plone 7, I think. Or maybe we can iterate slowly over this, it's probably better. And on top of this, we have um, products CMF Plone. That's a kind of separator between the layers because product CMF Plone depends on a lot of stuff and other packages are depending on CMF Plone, right? So in our mental model, we always have to think about do we depend on something in CMF Plone, then we are above, then it's like REST API depends on it, working copy support depends on it, Plone Volta depends on it. And if we go further, we could say, well, what do we now have in the core and do not use in Volto like the Portlet engine could be then outside of this and depends on CMF Plone. And that's architectural decisions on they would need to do in future. And But to, to, to be able to do this, we need this Plone mental model. We need some boxes to put our stuff in to think about in, in the rough decisions. And then we can go further into more fine-grained uh, boxes inside these drawers we have, right? So that's the base idea I wanted to show. That was the outcome of the Beethoven sprint. I ha had not the, I had really a nice document with all the packages listed that, and did the different boxes, but I actually I lost it. So I draw this thing. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there. So um, on Wednesday's lightning talk, Victor introduced his um, Chrome extension for logging into um, logging into Volto through the through the through the browser. Sorry, through the through the Chrome extension, um, and that got me thinking um, that Eric has a similar Chrome extension that does the the backend reload or the the, the Zope reload. But unfortunately, it doesn't work with Volto because you're not connected to the backend; you're connected to the front end. And this is a bit of a problem because you then have to open a new browser, log in, and um, and do the reload there. So I've created this package, Plone Volto Reloader. You just add it to your Volto pro project, and now when you want to uh, reload Plone, it's just going to work. So what does it do? So it's an Express Middleware adapter uh, add-on for um, Volto. It does the proxy to the Zope root. It authenticates with either admin admin or admin secret, and it'll set your VHM path so it all works properly. Uh, and yeah, um, it's on my GitHub, uh, it's on uh, Node, you, yeah, you can get all the stuff there, file bug reports, etc. So yeah, thank you very much. I tried, so <laughs> sorry, but I cannot see. Tu sais pas, Medel? Parce que c'est ça. Pas ton miroir. Ouais, mais je sais, mais voilà, voilà. Okay, that's it. Yes, lightning talks are not only for developers. Sorry. <laughs> As some of you ask me, uh, so what? They were wondering, wondering about those two guys at the corner of the conference building. Um, people from Namur are considered as slow people. But it's not true, of course. But I was born in Namur, so that's not true. Uh, the, in fact, the, um, in the old times, uh, people, um, before doing something, they had to think twice, to take their time. It's not the case now, nowadays. And so that the story is, uh, hey, watch out. The snail, if it goes out, we just won't be able to catch it up because we are too slow. That's the story of those stones. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So that's less important, probably not in me. <laughs> so we are a public company with a revenue of uh, 5 million euros with, without subsidies from the Wallonian region. There's a public services, it's not frequent. 15% um, percent growth each year, um, 50 employees, and 383 uh, local authorities working, uh, members, not clients for public authorities, they are called members. Uh, that's uh, nearly uh, more than 90% of uh, uh, Wallonia uh, for the towns, and they practically all using plones, it's the case for towns, all the 90% of the towns are using plone for a uh, website, but also for their back office. And so yes, it's uh, continued to be uh, successful. Um, and some words about the reason of the success of uh, EMEO, part of the plone tool, of course, uh, with the quality of the tool and the possibility to uh, implement uh, at the same time back offices and, and a website with the same technology. And for a city, it's very important to have uh, the back office linked to the website because it's a complex website, of course, many activities for, for, uh, for cities. And um, the e democracy now, because um, uh, citizens want to have uh, transparent processes, especially for e-government, not for Facebook, Google, and so on, but for e-government, they really have uh, a need of uh, transparency. And so that's really the case with uh, the tools we are setting for them. Um, uh, for example, uh, each uh, city, of course, has a city council to take decisions, and those uh, decisions are published uh, before they are um, accepted by the city council to the citizen. And we have, even in Belgium, changed the law because the, the system is so well-tuned that it's possible uh, automatically to publish the decision without any effort for the city servants. So it really becomes an automatic process of governors. So it's very interesting. And the citizen in the portal here just put some words to find the decision for its city. We will add in the, in the future geolocalization. And so it's a really very new project, uh, even in Europe. And uh, this is an example of a decision before it has been accepted by the city council. So for democracy, it's important to have such tools. And because Plone and open source uh, is um, both in the back office and the front office, uh, it's transparent and you have no black box. And so it's very interesting for politics to know there is no black box in the government system. That's it. Thank you. You see this? Okay. You can start the clock. Anyhow, uh, this is uh, Pareto Security's dashboard. It's a pyramid app for the back end, and there's an Elm application for the front end. And uh, I want to go here and add some new field or whatever. Um, so I go into my terminal. Let's see if I can make it slightly larger. Uh, the problem is uh, I don't have Python installed. Uh, I don't have Elm installed. I also need Postgres because Postgres runs as a database. Um, so now I'm thinking, uh, should I use Homebrew or PyEnv to get Python? And then Elm has some Haskell dependencies. So how are those are installed? Um, also need JavaScript to wrap everything up together. So I'm, it's going to take me an afternoon to get everything set up. Or I can just go into my project, wait a few seconds and 
I have the exactly correct Python version. Uh, I even have black of the correct version. So I have different black versions across my different projects. So I have, the, the editor will pick up exactly the correct version of black for this project. Uh, there's PGCLI that matches you know, my database. There's Gecko driver for uh, browser tests, which again is the correct version and it's not some globally installed thingy. Um, yeah, there's Elm. Uh, there's Elm format, I think should be there, which is Haskell. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's magic. Uh, it, this magic is called Nix and find this blog post, blog post on, 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 on our blog uh, where I'll explain the details, how it works, and also some examples. Because this whole thing is, is provided by a single document, single configuration file where you define your dependencies for your project and not just Python dependencies, everything, like everything that you need to work on a project down to the correct Git version if you want. Um, yeah, that's it. If everyone has it, I can unplug. I will. Sorry, the adapter. Does that do anything? It does something, yeah. Make that bigger. What? No. Hi, Erico. Okay. <laughs> Add something on Discord, and now it's uh, not running. Get the screen back, hopefully. I want to talk a bit about Plone Future or some possible futures. Uh, I work for Sys Software, I've been doing that a long time. That's in the ne Netherlands. And yeah, I now live in Belgium and now toying or a bit more serious idea of creating my own company. There's no website yet, but you can email me, maurits at pi76.be, and now you know wh when I was born. Uh, of course, when you start your own company, you don't have clients yet, so I have all time in the world to work on the core plone. So then when I do that, yeah, within one week, plone six uh, will be finished, and then I get bored. So I need some other stuff to do, so I have some ideas that I can work on, or maybe people can help on it, you never know. If you need a sprint topic, and that can, that can be nice. Uh, there's a password policy plugin or plugin system in, the, in Plone has been in there for, for years. I don't know if people really use it, but we could maybe add some policies uh, in core Plone. Uh, I've also think been f at least five years, some ideas for new policies in CMF editions. You currently say, okay, uh, uh, keep the last 20 revisions, but yeah, why can't we say keep the all revisions of the last year? Or combine that, uh, keep the last 10 revisions, at, le at least 10 revisions and at least everything of the last year. That should be possible. Uh, you can also change collective revision manager uh, with basically the same idea. Okay, add a button there to purge all revisions that are older than one year. Just clean up your database a bit. Uh, we can work on an image transform chain, if that sounds like something you like, uh, see my focal points uh, talk last year. Uh, we can always make the code more Pythonic, Plone 6 uh, only runs on Python 3.8 and higher, so we can use the walrus operator and all kinds of other things that make the code more Pythonic. Uh, we can do more separation between backend and frontend, also in classic. For example, yeah, maybe the classic UI can start calling more things from uh, the REST API. Uh, for example, also for searching or for the folder content. There's probably lots of things possible. Uh, we can move all classic UI code like Plone up layout, Plone up portlets uh, into one kind of mono repo package, Plone classic UI, and move all that yeah, just into one repository to work on that. It's definitely not for Plone 6, don't, uh, don't get me wrong. Maybe Plone 7, 8, 9, I don't know. Uh, we can try to say, okay, only load generic setup uh, in ZCML when Plone Up Upgrade is available. Some people only include Plone Up Upgrade in 
Yeah, the editor side and not on the public uh, part, they don't include that package. Like, yeah, if Plone static resources, uh, those uh, some upgrade steps that are there are still loaded, maybe you can say, okay, only loaded when Plone up upgrade is actually available, just to get a bit less CCML loaded. Uh, the toolbar is actually very nice to see at the top by default, maybe we can do that. Someone else left to do that, I don't have a real opinion there and don't know what I'm doing. Uh, you can store the catalog in, in Postgres. That would be an easy uh, thing to try uh, tomorrow. What can go wrong? <laughs> uh, get rid of the relations catalog and intits because it's far too difficult. Uh, you need to study 10 years in informatics before you try to, can try to understand it. We can make some easier, some easier utilities uh, there. Maybe some migration added from one to another and you can maybe run it side by side for comparison. There's always old ideas to unify viewlets and portlets, make that into slots and blocks, which might be crazy. And one personal thing that I've noticed this week, we could use an autosave and editing a page. For example, I'm now here editing this page and I want to save it, but maybe the internet connection uh, go goes down just when I press save and I lose everything. So then I usually select everything, copy it just to be sure, and then I press, uh, press save. Yeah, you know how that works, and I edit it again. Uh, it would be nice if there's some button or a thing that I can click or really automatically to save either the TinyMC text or maybe a block if you're running in Volto or save everything that you've changed uh, here. You save that already to the database. And that would have helped me a lot uh, this week. Save some uh, typos. Uh, if you see typos in here anywhere, uh, just send me an email or ping me somewhere, and uh, I'll fix that in the in the summaries. So just some ideas. If you're bored, you can uh, work on that. Thank you. I'll copy some things. Hello, uh, I'm Eric Bio, and I was in charge of uh, Google Solomon of Code this year, and I plan to do that again next year. And about that, uh, at the time we register as, as, a, as an organization to, to be a, a GSOC host, uh, we don't have a lot of time to produce uh, topics, subjects, and it's actually super nice. So I just want to say, if you have an idea at any moment in the year, if you think something is, would be nice, could be useful, whatever, and it's not necessarily a core thing that would fit into a sprint, well, not it down, so we can do that as a, as a GSOC uh, topic. Because most part of the time you're gonna say, yeah, well, that would be nice, and well, you're lazy and you don't do it, or maybe you just think you're too busy, but actually you're just lazy. And we need this kind of stuff to be done, so uh, be, do that, please. I don't know, just to know how many people here has been GSOC students in their life? Yes, a few. And how many of you have been GSOC mentors? Good. So the rest of you, you're lazy. BGSOC, <laughs> BGSOC mentors is super nice. It doesn't take a lot of time. And as you have someone asking for questions and so on, you will have to just control your laziness and make sure things happen. It does not take a lot of time. It is a super nice thing to do. It increases plans the software. It increases plans the community. So all benefits there. That's all. Hello, um, as I am not attending the sprint tomorrow and I won't be able to help you with translating Plone and Volto to all of your languages, I thought that I could make a game here and play it with you with one of the smallest languages in, in Plone. So, do you want, well, I, I, will show, I, I will show you some uh, words and sentences and then we will translate them. And if someone understands something, just tell me, okay? Kaisho? Agur? Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Don't spoil my talk, okay? 
zer modu zaude? Garagardo bat, mesedez? We have long words, but we are not Germans. Datorren urtean, gure herri aldean? I guess nobody understands this, except something, Eric? Few words, okay. So, kaixo means hello. Agur means bye. Ser modu saude means how are you. Garagardo bat mesedes Garagardo bat mesedes means one beer, please. Datorren urtean gure herri aldean means next year in our country. As you may know, we come from the Basque country, in, or Euskal Herria, like we say in our language, and we are located in this European corner between Spain and France. Specifically, we are located in a city with 30,000 uh, yeah, 30, inhabitants, and we are going to organize the conference in the Basque country next year. We haven't the dates yet, that's why we say October, November 2023. We don't even have the location yet. We are working on it. But this is the people that, who, will make, who will make the conference possible, our team at Close Syntax, and we hope to see you next year in the Basque Country. Camera. You can, you can read. Ah, yes. Uh, the text is there, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank you all for coming uh, to Namur. Those conferences uh, will not happen without this amazing community. <laughs> thank you to the city of Namur for their patronage. And thank you also for Analux. Uh, who was the, the training, it was really, uh, we were lucky to have this high school and students today also and doing the training. So it's very interesting for uh, a community to have also some students. Thank you to our sponsor, uh, the silver ones and the bronze. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we would like really to to thank people from uh, Imeo and Affinity uh, who made this conference possible. Please come all on the stage. People of Affinity. Come on, guys.
thank you to La Film Equipe, who handled the streaming. <laughs> and a special thanks to Erico, Kim, Victor, Rico Pekka, and Philippe, who help us organizing this conference. Then, see you uh, next year in Spain, in Basque country. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, is this live? I had totally winging this, but uh, it was something like three years ago. We twisted arms, Joël and Martin, to get them to agree to host this conference here. Uh, we knew that they'd contributed so much already in their use of Plone and their team getting MEO software into so many places uh, here. And so uh, it was with great happiness that uh, they, to us that they agreed three years ago. Well, as you, can, as you know, uh, it took three years to get this conference organized, but you can see how wonderful their, their team and they um, have been with their hospitality. So uh, please join me again in thanking them for hosting this wonderful conference again, bringing us back together for the first time in a long time.